Hello, BookTube. Uh, today's essay is from William Dana Orcutt's From My Library Walls, A Kaleidoscope of Memories. And here's the dust jacket that I've taken off. Uh, we've read one uh, from his from this book already. It was called uh, The Vatican Hospital for Sick Books. And this was published in 1946 in book form by John Murray of in, out of London. Now, most of the articles he notes were published in the Christian Science Monitor, and he gives thanks for that, allowing him to reprint. The essay we're going to read today is Beauty in Low-Cost Books. But just to preface to say that, yeah, William Dana Orcott uh, was a book designer, uh, um, type designer, and he, well, he wrote books about books, uh, a number of them, and he lived from 1870 to 1953, and he lived mostly in Boston, hence the connection with the Christian Science Monitor. Now, the essay um, is fairly short, but it, it raises a few things that I think are worth discussing, which uh, maybe we can do at the end. Uh, for the first time in history, a while ago, the Club of Odd Volumes, the famous organization of book lovers, staged in their attractive clubhouse on Beacon Hill in Boston, a public exhibition of volumes designed and produced by a publisher's printer, and graciously invited me to play the host. Usually such exhibitions as these have shown the product of private presses, sumptuous limited editions printed on handmade paper and bound in full leather, intended for the libraries of book collectors and others financially able to pay the necessary difference in cost in order to secure a beautiful volume of which only a restricted number have been produced. In this exhibition, which contained about a hundred items, over half represented trade volumes produced by a single designer for over uh, 30 different publishing houses to be reta uh, retailed at from one to five dollars a copy. The exhibit contained sumptuous volumes as well. There was, for instance, the subscription edition of Science and Health. There was Petrarch's Triumphs, printed on parchment and richly illuminated by an Italian artist. And there limited editions running as high as $400 a volume. But emphasis was particularly given to demonstrate the beauty and design and workmanship can be introduced into low-cost books. The fact that this exhibition attracted many more visitors than any other exhibit the club had ever sponsored, and an extension of the dates was necessitated, would seem to indicate that the public possesses a desire, as yet not fully satisfied, to study the physical aspect of volumes within their reach as purchaser volumes not merely printed, but volumes actually designed and produced with the same care and thought as may be found in the more expensive editions. From the press and individual comments at the time, I believe the exhibit demonstrated my lifelong contention that it is quite possible to build low-cost volumes upon the same principles as deluxe editions, eliminating the expensive materials by retaining the harmony and consistency that came from designing the book from an architectural standpoint. It adds little to the expense to select a type and properly uh, a type that properly expresses the thought which the author wishes to convey, or to have the presses touch the letters uh, into their paper in such a way as to become part of it, without that heavy impression which makes the reverse side appear like an example of braille, or to find a machine-made paper soft to the feel and grateful to the eye on which the page is placed with well-considered margins, or to use illustrations or decorations, if warranted at all, in such a way as to assist the imagination of the reader, rather than divert it from the text, to uh, plan a title page which, like the door of a house, door to a house, invites the reader to open it and proceed. Its type lines carefully balanced with the blank, or to bind even the cloth with uh, trig squares and with designs of lettering to, in keeping with the printing inside. By way of example, in the ex exhibit, there were two volumes side by side, one on the same subject and both illustrated by famous artists. The first contained in full color the illustrations of the life of Francis made by the eminent Spanish artist Subercasi, uh, with accompanying text uh, printed on handmade paper. 
The other volume, a little smaller, was Everybody's St. Francis by Maurice Egan, illustrated by the celebrated Bouet de Monville. These illustrations were printed, some from beautiful monotone plates and some in full color on a dull service coated stock. The text was on a high quality uh, machine made paper. The first mentioned volume was limited to 500 copies and sold for $25. The second was a trade edition with no limit and sold for $2. The materials employed varied, it is true, in cost, but the same careful design and meticulous execution is shown in both. I chatted with a little woman who was carefully examining these two volumes, and she expressed an idea which, has, which was worth considering. I wonder, she said, why is it that some people are willing to pay more and seem to be, take a greater satisfaction in books which can only be shared by a limited number. When I have a beautiful thing, I love to share it, and if I can get the same beauty and additional pleasure at a lower cost, that seems to me to be a real achievement. Trade books, as they are now insured, issued, sorry, let's start again there for that paragraph, Trade books, as they are now issued from the various publishing houses, represent a much higher standard of excellence in design and workmanship than was the case even ten years ago, when I began my own service in the book, service to the book, fifty years ago under the friendly eye of John Wilson, at the time the head of the old university press in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The idea of a printer's design dining book was unheard of. In fact, the volumes of the early 1890s showed little in way of design. What was the period? That was the period of splendid uh, Merkin. Start again here. That was the period of splendid mechanical excellent hand typesetting, uh, meticulous proofreading, and press fine press work, but with no thought that printing was uh, the handmaiden of art. In one of the books on typography written by Theodore de L. Divine, an outstanding book manufactured of its period, uh, you will find the statement, a printer who uh, poses as an oracle of good taste in printing would be rated as a typographical peacock. The first commission I received to design a book came quite by accident. I was lunching in New York with Paul Reynolds, the well-known literary agent. After discussing the personal business that had brought us together, Reynolds remarked, I had a curious experience yesterday. W.B. Yeats, the Irish poet, is one of my clients, and he sent me a little manuscript with the request that I have it printed for him in attractive style, not for publication, but for him to give to his friends. I took it to the Divine uh, Press and read Mr. Divine's letter. How do you wish to have it made? Mr. Divine asked me. Now I don't know anything about making books, Reynolds continued, and I told him so. He smiled genially, handed the letter back to me. Better write Mr. Yates and ask him how he wants the book made, Divine said. Then we would be very glad to manufacture the volume for him. Would you care to let me have a crack at it? I inquired with the confidence of youth. You take a load off my mind, Reynolds laughed, and the manuscript came to me for design and manufacture. Incidentally, this experience turned me into a designer first and a book manufacturer afterwards. This incident, as I write, write it sounds incredible in view of the fact that today no bookmaking establishment of any uh, pretensions is without a typographical consultant whose research and taste are placed at the disposal of its clients. The reason for the improved standard in trade volumes lies largely in the fact that the buying public has become more intelligently critical in recognizing a well-made book. They have learned or are learning that the book design designing is an architectural rather than a hit or miss putting together of various parts. In the final analysis, the quality of manufacturer rests in the hands of a book buying public. The publishers are quick to recognize whether or not indifference is a business liability, but the public itself must be sufficiently educated to criticize the physical appearance of a book to make its protest effective. I find that very interesting. Um, I do agree that there was a period, like, books began to be made better um, at certain periods throughout all the history of uh, publishing and bookbinding. 
but this was 1946. The book buyer at that time may have become educated, but today, I don't think they are. Uh, well, especially the, the average uh, book buyer. They are willing to take anything that's, that's poorly uh, printed. Uh, however, I do see a booktubers uh, talk about how great a book is, is made. It's cheaply made. It's paper-covered boards, thin boards. It's perfect binding. It's just really, really poorly printed. And, and, and there's a lot of publishers that are not even using acid-free paper anymore. And now, I, I, I'd like to distinguish these... Well, I, I do distinguish some of these people as, as young, under, say, 30 generally. And it's, I, I don't think it's their fault. I don't, it's, it's because used bookstores have disappeared over the last 20 years, basically. So a lot of people don't have the experience of going in and picking up a nice, finely made book, feeling the cloth... And, you know, just just the feel of it and look at how it's stitched and everything like that. They, they don't have that experience anymore. So all they get is something from uh, an online uh, bookseller that is just poorly made. They might have a nice, pretty design on the cover or they might do a design on the paper. But it's just poorly made. At least that's, that's how I see it. So that has all gone out of the window of any educated public in general now because... Uh, the publishers do not spend, in general, any money on making the book a uh, well, uh, well-made book anymore, I don't think. And it's very rare they do, and it will be the small publishers that, that, that will do it occasionally, or limited editions. And even then, um, there's problems, I think. Uh, I don't know, does anybody else uh, have, have experienced that as well? Uh, it's just that it seems that publishers want to get the highest amount and put the least amount of money into the book itself. I, that's probably always been there, but uh, it sounds like for a time there, they had some printers and designers that actually uh, you know, cared about a uh, book and, and just spent a little more time uh, and care in, in designing it and printing it which I don't think has happened for many decades now. Uh, but I, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's why I thought it was a, a very interesting, uh, a very interesting essay, uh, especially for book collectors, because um, I, I like, I like a book. I like, like this year, you know, I, 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 you know, the same, the same information is going to be in an X library one or a paperback copy of this. But if I really enjoy it, which I am enjoying uh, his writings and other ones, I want something that feels nice holding. There's, there's, uh, reading is a, an experience to me more than anything. It's tactile, um, and it's, it's like the paper will feel a certain way. And when you feel that in a book, um, it, it, makes, it makes a big difference. And, you, and me, as a collector which sometimes is a bad word to people. They think, oh, that, you're a collector. But no, anybody who actually keeps books and doesn't just pass them on is a collector of books. I don't care. Uh, whether you use the books as, as reference material on a daily basis, you're still a collector. You're collecting the books that are useful to you. Uh, and people have different ways of collecting. Uh, some collect um, just one publisher because that's what they're interested in. Um, so it's, it's all collecting, um, and, and everybody will, despite, I think, what people say that if they do collect books, oh, I don't really care about, uh, the condition and that, they, they do, they do, uh, because they, they will, they, they won't buy something that's a ratted copy, uh, next, if it's right next to something that is a nice, pristine copy or a really good shape for a couple pounds more or a couple dollars more. Most people won't, won't buy the inferior copy or the damaged copy. Generally, they won't. Because they, they do like uh, to look at, uh, have it look on the shelves as well as, as it looks nice. There, there's that as well. Books do furnish a room, um, as, as the book title says uh, by Anthony Pohl. Uh, but anyway, I'll end it there. That's getting up to 15 minutes. I'd love to hear uh, other people's ideas on this, on, on whether or not books are still made well. I, I don't think they are, but I'd like to hear from other people. And, and why is that? Why are they not being made well now? And why uh, are people don't realize that they're not made well anymore? But anyway, have a good evening, BookTube. Bye.